Honourable Member for Toronto, Danforth. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to be sharing my time with the member for Winnipeg North. Je suis fière de prendre la parole au sujet du projet de loi. I'm proud to speak today about Bill C-37, an act that I support wholeheartedly. It is a necessary step in addressing the opioid crisis in our country. The bill makes amendments to the Customs Act and the Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Act. But I will be focusing on the amendments the bill will make to the Controlled Drug and Substances Act. The changes to the Controlled Drug and Substances Act are important to our government's revision of the Canadian Drugs and Substances Strategy, which restores harm reduction as a core pillar of Canada's drug policy. The return of this evidence-based approach to substances marks a return to our, of our drug policy to a health matter once again. I want to acknowledge the pain that has been experienced by so many families across our country as a result of the opioid crisis. My hope is that by passing this act, we will be preventing further deaths due to the use of opioids. This act gives healthcare professionals the freedom to plan for and implement harm reduction strategies to assist people who are struggling with drug use. It helps to destigmatize this disease that is taking lives every day across Canada. It will allow people to get medical assistance when they need it most. It is thus important that we all stand and support these changes. Let me address the situation in Ontario and specifically in my community on this issue. The Chief Coroner for Ontario, Dr. Dirk Hoyer, reports annually on deaths from opioid toxicity. If you look at the numbers, you will see quickly that it is not just fentanyl that is killing people in Ontario. It is also codeine, heroin, hydromorphone, methadone, morphine, and oxycodone, sometimes mixed with alcohol. The number of deaths is rising. In 2004, there were 246 deaths from opioid and opioid alcohol toxicity. In 2015, that number had risen to 707 deaths. It is estimated that one in eight deaths of Ontarians between the ages of 25 and 34 is related to opioid use. Toronto has seen a 77% increase in overdose deaths over the past decade. The toll in East Toronto, where my community is located, has been high. Research cited by the South Riverdale Community Health Centre shows a disproportionately high number of injection drug users in our community and higher rates of emergency department visits due to opioid or cocaine use in our community than in Toronto overall. In 2013, a memorial was unveiled at Queen Street and Carlaw Avenue in my riding. The memorial, which is believed to be the first of its kind in North America, helps us to remember the people in our community who have died from drug overdoses. It is a space to help families and friends heal. It encourages us to support public education and highlights the impact the war on drugs has had on the lives of people who are with us and those who have gone beyond. More than 60 people contributed to the creation of the memorial with the guidance of artist Rocky Doby. Regarding the memorial, he stated, the sculpture is only a small part of this project. Many more ideas have been generated, including a print exhibit, an annual memorial at the sculpture, and simple storytelling of memories at these meetings. Hopefully, the project will continue to draw the community together. At the time that it was unveiled, there were 79 names. By this summer, we had around 130 names, and more are being added. The stories and memories that are embodied in the sculpture should recall to all of us that work remains to be done to support our neighbours in this struggle. This past summer, this sculpture was a site of a memorial, memorial for a young community peer and street outreach worker who specialised in harm reduction. 
Her name was Brooklyn McNeil. She was a strong advocate for safe consumption sites in Toronto. She appeared before the Toronto Board of Health and spoke very, very eloquently in favour of harm reduction. I listened to her deputation last night and her presentation hits hard. She spoke of how accidental overdoses could be prevented by safe injection sites and she recounted her own overdose experiences. She closed her statement saying, respect for all members of the community is so important, especially not looking at addicts as invaders, but as part of the community. Unfortunately, she died of a drug overdose in June at the age of 22. She died before the Toronto Board of Health voted to approve three safe consumption sites in Toronto. I do feel that Brooklyn McNeil's view of community is echoed, however, in the deputation made by the chair of the Leslieville BIA, Andrew Sherbin, who spoke at Toronto City Hall in favour of a safe consumption site in my community at the South Riverdale Community Health Centre. He stated, we will always be a neighbourhood that welcomes people, not one that turns them away. And both of their stri statements strike to me the very point of harm reduction that we do not help people by turning them away. Sites. The Act puts into place five benchmarks to be met for a safe consum consum consumption site to be approved, and they are as follows. To exist. Two, demonstration of appropriate consultation in the community. Three, presentation of evidence on whether the site will impact crime in the community. Four, ensuring regulatory systems are in place, and five, site room of opponents will need to prove that appropriate resources are in place. By putting these benchmarks into place, the bill returns our law to the state it was, was after the Supreme Court of Canada's 2011 decision that allowed Insight to operate in British Columbia. That was without the overbearing harmful and unnecessary regulatory framework set up by the former Conservative government. An organization in my community, as I have mentioned, the South Riverdale Community Health Centre, has applied to expand harm reduction services that they already provide. The centre is one of the three that was approved by the Toronto Board of Health and it has been operating harm reduction needle exchange since 1998. That is about 20 years. It is one of the busiest harm reduction needle exchange programs in Toronto and in 2015 served over 3,000 people who use drugs. The South Riverdale Community Health Centre states in their background document relating to their application for a supervised injection site that international and Canadian research shows that such sites have benefits for individuals using the services and the community, including one, reducing the number of drug overdose and deaths, reducing risk factors relating to infectious diseases such as HIV and hepatitis, increasing the use of detox and drug treatment services, connecting people with other health and social services, and reducing the amount of publicly discarded needles. The Centre's study of clients who seek help relating to injection drugs showed that around 30% of the clients injected in public. Ensuring needle, that needles are not discarded in public is an important health goal, and it's something that this Act helps us achieve. Members of my community signed a petition in support of a safe consumption site, and the wording of the petition stated as follows. Leslieville is a progressive, welcoming, and inclusive community. As individuals who live and work in the community, we support the establishment of a small-scale safe injection service at the South Riverdale Community Health Centre. With a 41% increase in fatal overdoses over a 10-year period in Toronto and the existence of discarded needles in the neighbourhood, this service will not only prevent unnecessary deaths, but keep the community safer. South Riverdale Community Health Centre has been operating a robust and successful harm reduction program for almost 20 years and this small but important addition will protect those individuals who already use the program and the community at large. I would like to conclude 
with the comments of one of my constituents that who made, she made at the Toronto Board of Health. Her name is Margaret Harvey, and she said, as a community, we owe it to ourselves and to each other to make harm reduction a priority, to give the vulnerable a chance to help the, get the help they need, and to make our streets, parks, and other public spaces safer for everyone. So too, as a country, do we owe it to the vulnerable to ensure that they do not face barriers to access the health care that they need to keep them safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, questions and comments? Question and comment. uh, the Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just heard my colleague talk about the um, importance of this legislation, and I will agree with her that there's many important measures in it. There is one area, of course, that we do have concerns about. But more importantly, and I have to say this again, it was back in April of this 2016 when BC declared a state of emergency. It is now February where they have finally got around to putting some legislation for consideration. And I do also have to note that yesterday we're busy talking about Stats Canada. So can I ask her how she feels both about her colleague, uh, the member from Vancouver Centre, who says that this government is moving too slowly. If it was happening in Ontario, they would be moving faster. And second of all, is dealing with the Stats Canada Act more important than this bill, in her opinion? Honourable Member for Toronto, Danforth. Uh, I, I appreciate that my colleague is pointing out the importance of this issue and the fact that we all see that we need to urgently address the opioid crisis. There, there's no question about that. That is something that we need to respond to. And that, that's why I'm so happy that we're having this debate in this place today. I want to point out, though, that we have been, as a government, taking action on this issue already. Uh, we made the overdose antidote Nexolone more widely available in Canada. In fact, one of the points that was brought up in the deputation that I mentioned at the Board of Health was that the use of Nexolone had saved this woman's life once in the past. Um, and we granted Section 56 exemptions for the Dr. Dr. Peter Centre and extended the exemption for Insight for an additional four years. So we, we are taking steps and we're now debating this legislation right here. This is what we need to do to make it happen.